nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our tutorial, Microstructure Modeling with OOF. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Andrew Reed and Dr. Steve Langer from NIST. Dr. Reed is a computational material scientist in the Material Measurement Lab at NIST, and Dr. Langer is a physicist in the Applied and Computational Mathematics Division of the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. We're going to, this today we're going to give a, an introduction to the OOF2 and OOF3D software that is available at NIST and also on NanoHub. Um, the presentation is going to mostly be pretty basic and mostly concentrate on OOF2 just for time reasons because it's simpler to explain. But we'll, I hope I'll um, be able to cover everything. So basically what it is, the software is uh, programs that compute the properties of materials with complex microstructures. And they do that by starting with an image of the microstructure so you're working with real geometry. The, um, it's a brute force calculation. We're not doing any kind of averaging. You're doing, you're trying to compute the properties of this one particular instance of the microstructure. So here are three possible examples, two real ones and one simulated microstructure that you might use in OOF2. So we're not doing any averaging. We're not creating an average type of typical microstructure. This is a particular geometry. So the idea is to investigate how the small scale geometry affects the material properties. And it's meant to be accessible, you know, on systems like NanoHub, but also on our workstation. Conceptually, what you start with, the thing that is like a document um, for OOF is the microstructure class. And the microstructure contains many things. It contains images. It could contain more than one version of an image for the same microstructure because image processing might help bring out one Different, you can get, see different features and with different kinds of image processing. It creates the materials, which are assembled from lists of material properties that are assigned to the features in the image. The first, the, we, what we call a skeleton, is the geometry of a finite element mesh, just the shapes of the elements. And you can create more than one skeleton for the same geometry in the microstructure. Um, and then from a skeleton, you add on the mathematics and the physics, and that gives you a real finite element mesh. And then on that mesh, you can compute a solution to the problems you're interested in. So the basic steps are to create a microstructure by loading an image in, identify the features in the image. This is uh, like image segmentation if you're coming from the image processing side. You create materials by specifying the properties, assign the materials to the pixels or to pixel groups in the um, microstructure, create the skeleton, adapt the skeleton to the image, then create a mesh, define fields and activate equations, apply the boundary conditions, solve the equations, and visualize and analyze the, the results. The physics that OOF handles are you have a bunch of fields, phi, and some fluxes, sigma. A flux is related to a field through some modulus coefficients um, here, ki. So, like for example, the 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 strain, the, the displacement is a field. Gradients of the displacement are the strain, and multiply that by the um, elastic modulus, and you get the stress, which is a flux. Or you could have temperature, um, thermal conductivity, and heat flow as in this equation. And then the divergence of the flux is the external forces. And if you had time dependence problems, you time dependent problems, you'd add in first or second order time derivatives of the fields here. So OOF can handle pretty much anything of this form, including some nonlinear generalizations of it. it. This includes elasticity, thermal conductivity, thermal expansion, piezo and, pie and pyroelectricity are all built into OOF. Plasticity is in development. And some things that are easy to add because they're all of this form are chemical diffusion or even some simple fluid flow models. There are no built-in units in OOF. Um, you can use whatever units you want as long as all your numerical in inputs are in a consistent set of units. So 
coming from NIST, I'm, have to say that SI units are what is preferred, but it's not built into OOF. You can use anything you want as long as it's consistent. Now, OOF has, there are two versions of OOF, OOF 2 and OOF 3D. OOF 2 uses this coordinate system where X is horizontal and Y is vertical in the plane of the screen. Um, Z is out of the plane towards you. It solves generalizations of plane stress or plane stress problems. That means it's taking a slice out of a 3D system and plane strain generalizes to saying that a field has no z derivatives plane stress generalizes to saying that a flux has no z components and um but the materials that oof2 uses are always a full 3d definition of it because you're thinking of this as taking a slice out of a, of a, a, a um, 3d system and so the orientations and rotations that you specify are always full 3d orientations then, of course, in OOF3D, everything is 3D. Now, I'm going to briefly mention differences between OOF2 and OOF3D um, before we even get started, um, just to make sure that this gets covered. Um, so, OOF3D doesn't read a single image. It, re it reads a directory full of image slices, which are sorted by file name in the Z direction. Um, at the moment, it's not easy to upload a whole directory of images to NanoHub, but we'll work on solutions to that. And of course, there's no plane strain or plane stress equivalence in 3D. And then in 3D, the graphics is trickier. So there's controls for rotating and moving the point of view and for clipping so you can see inside the system. Um, and a lot of you know, the graphics interaction is just um, more difficult. Um, and we try to make tools that are intuitive and in how to um, handle that. And some of the user interface has actually been simplified in OOF3D, but currently OOF3D is using an older version of the GUI toolkit. So at this point, what I'm going to do is start up OOF2. So this is the main OOF2 window, and I tried to make the fonts bigger than they normally appear. And I should say I'm running this on my local laptop instead of on NanoHub. It looks basically the same on NanoHub. It's just a little easier for me to do the demo here. So the main window has at the top this bar here, which is a task switcher. There are a bunch of different pages, microstructure, image, pixel selection, and so on, that are arranged in here more or less in the order in which you go through them in solving a problem. There are menu items that apply to all the um, tasks up here. And this is a message window that you can look at to see what's going on or to get output. So. The first thing to do is to um, create a microstructure by loading in an image. I could create a microstructure and just give it a fixed size without loading an image. But the easiest thing to do is load from an image file. So I click that. It gives me a um, pop-up window here. Now, this here lets me is a fairly standard file selector. And I can click on the image that I want to use here. Down here are three inputs that are currently filled with automatic. Anything in OOF where it says automatic is um, you can just leave it the way it is and it will fill it with a reasonable value. Or you can type something in. Whoops, I tried typing in the wrong thing. Okay, so if I type up here, it selects that, but I need to get. So if I type demo here, it erases the automatic automatically and puts in what if I I want to go back to automatic, I just delete everything that I typed. So that's the name I'm going to give them my microstructure. Um, the height and width are the physical units that you want to use for the region of the material that you're looking at in the image. So I'm going to set height to one. If I had left it at automatic, if they're both set to automatic height and width, then the pixels are going to be one by one in whatever units you're using. I'm going to set height to one, and then width will be left to automatic. That will mean that the pixels will be square, but the total height will be one, and click OK. Now in the microstructure window, at the top here in the microstructure page, there's a this is a pull-down menu that lists all the microstructures that you have. We only have one, so there's not, it's not very interesting, but you can switch between different microstructures there. This tells you info about the current microstructure, its size in pixels, and its physical size, 0.7 by 1. That's the one that I had entered before. Now, I can look at that by opening a graphics window, a Windows Graphics New, 
And then this is a, um, a frequently asked question. Why, does, why is this blank? So I need to go through and switch back. So why is the graphics window empty? So OOF2 in earlier versions before the one that's now currently on NanoHub used to always guess what it should display in the window and it sometimes did it wrong. So we had a new policy because that was confusing. The new policy was don't display anything automatically. And you can change that policy. So any in each window, you can set the new layer policy to one of three things. Never, which is never, that's the default, never display anything automatically. Single, display one thing. If, if there's only one thing, so it's obvious what to display, you display that or always display everything. And that's just a, usually a mess. You can set, make in the main window, you can make a setting that applies to all new graphics windows if you want to change that. Okay, so here we are in the graphics window. I'm going to make the setting new layer policy single. And now I need to actually, because I didn't make that setting before I opened the window, I need to um, create a new layer to display the image. So. The layer editor has three main parts, category, what, and how. Category is what kind of thing you're displaying. I want to display an image. What is which image you're displaying? Well, images belong in microstructure, so you first choose the microstructure, that's at the top, and then you choose which image in the microstructure. Like we have only one of each of those, so there's nothing to choose. And the how, there's only one way to just, well, one useful way to display an image at the moment, that's bitmap. So I click OK, and there is my image. Click Fill to make it full screen. And so this microstructure has really two materials, although one of them comes in three um, in different colors. There's the, the brown stuff in the background that's a matrix holding together these inclusions. And I was going to be cute and ask people to guess what they were, but I will say that the, this is actually marshmallows inside chocolate. So in this graphics window, you can zoom in and out. I could, this in button zooms in. I can zoom in to see that the microstructure is actually made out of pixels. We're not taking pixels as points. We're assuming that they're little rectangles. Um, you can also shift click to zoom in and, and zoom in around a particular point. So the point under the mouse has stayed fixed in the image. Now, one of the useful things you do with the graphics window is select pixels so you can make do operations on pixels. There are a bunch of pixel selection methods. Um, I can select an individual point just by clicking on it and you can see, I hope, that the, the pixel gets colored there. I can select a rectangle. You know, I can select by color. Now here, I'm, if I just click, because I'm selecting with these deltas set to zero, the color, I'm not selecting very many pixels. I can increase that a bit, and now I'll select more pixels. Um, go back to viewer and zoom out. You can see that the selection is sort of spotty there. I was trying to select, you know, this whole of this this pink region but it didn't do a very good job so there are modifications to the pixel selection tools um so okay one of the things that one of the reasons that this is the selection is sort of rough and spotty is that the image was actually noisy so i can go back um to the main oof2 window and go to the image page. The image page has a bunch of tools in it. First of all, so like before, you can choose what microstructure you're using on or what image, what microstructure you're using, what image you're using within that microstructure. I could load in new images here. This is, gives me some information about the current image that I'm using. And these are tools for modifying it. So I'm going to go back here clear the whole pixel selection, go back, look at the whole image. And now I know because I've done this before on this image that 
if I use the reduce noise tool with a radius of three and apply that three times, it smooths out the image pretty well. And then I'm going to do a sharpen once. Now, if I go back here, back to the pixel selection page, um, I can actually click repeat and that will repeat the previous click that I did, but now with the new image and it's still sort of jagged, but there are tricks you can do to, to well, I'll, I'll show you a different image um, selection tool first. So this, because I clicked on a particular image is showing me all the pixels that have a color within this range here of the pixel that I clicked on. What if I wanted to select just a set of contiguous pixels? Well, there's this burn tool. Burn is like, it's called that because it's like a forest fire. It started at one point and then it spreads. So if I click on a pixel in the green here, it will select that pixel and select the neighboring pixels if those pixels are similar enough to the pixel that I started on. That what similar enough means is determined by these two parameters, the local flammability and the global flammability. If I set the both to point one, I can click on that green object and it selects just the green object and, and I can click on if I shift click, it'll click with it will select without unselecting the previous one. So I can click on the yellow one and it selects that too. So it's it's not doing a great job selecting only the yellow pixels, green pixels, but you know what you mean when you say yellow pixels and green pixels, that depends on what your microstructure is, and that's sort of up to you. So that's why there are these parameters that that you can adjust. You have to do something that works with your um, microstructure, and you're the one who knows what your microstructure is. So is this good enough? Well, that depends on what it is that you're really looking at. So I've clicked on a bunch of pixels here. Let's see if I can, you know, is this good enough? Well, yes, let's say that it's, that is good enough for what we want now. But if I go, I'm gonna go back and zoom in on this region here. You see that my boundaries that I've selected are, are pretty rough. Let's say I didn't want that. Well, one thing you can do is go to the pixel selection page. Pixel selection is like image oper modification, but it only operates on the set of selected pixels. It doesn't actually change the image at all. So you know, simple things, I could invert the image by clicking on OK here. But one thing that's useful, there's a despeckle. What despeckle does is that it selects any pixel that has at least this many selected neighbors. So if I set that down to five and select all pixels with five selected neighbors, you see that it, it filled in and smoothed this out a little bit but, and undo and, and redo that. Um, go back, look at the whole thing. You can also get it even better sometimes by expanding the selection, I'll expand, this is expanded by a two pixel radius in every direction, and then do the despeckle. Um, and then shrink again by two pixels. Okay, and now you can see that it has actually smoothed things out. Um, if I zoom in here again, what had this, there had been a big indentation there that's now been removed. So is this good enough? Well, that depends, of course, as before on what it is you want. So let's just say that this is, this is a good representation of what we want for now. What can we do with this? Well, let's go back to the microstructure page and I'm gonna create a pixel group. So all of the pixels that are currently selected are going to be in a group. Um, and click new here to create a pixel group. It comes up with automatic. So I type stop, start typing. I'll call it chocolate. And then I add the pixels to automatic. So it, here it is. Chocolate has 13, almost 14,000 pixels in it. I can go back to the pixel selection. I should say that anything that is done through the toolboxes here 
is something that's operating on the graphics window. So if I want to invert the pixels that are in the graphics window, I can do that by um, going to the toolbox. Usually what the tool toolbox means is that it's operating on a click. So if I click on the graphics window, it did that burn operation again. Um, anything that is done through the graph through the main OOF window is not done through mouse interaction, but it still can be operating on the same pixel. So for example, this set of pixels is the selected set here. I can invert the selection here. Now the inverted selection I can add to a new group, which I can call MM for marshmallows. It has no pixels in it. I click add, it has 14,000 pixels in it. Now that we've you know, done some real work, it's useful to save it. So I'll go to the sa file, save menu, and I'm gonna save the microstructure. The microstructure contains the image, it contains the set of se selected pixels. Um, Steve, I, now, think you have, I think you have the same pixels in both groups. Um, certainly it's remarkable that they have the same number, yes. <laughs> Okay, so no, I, I must have added. So I think the, I think the chocolate one has the marshmallows in it, actually. Yes, you're right. right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're two of us here. <laughs> now you can, I, can, I can clear the pixel group that removed all the pixels from it. And go back, I'll invert this again and add those to chocolate. Okay, very good. Now I'm going to clear the selection again. The groups are still there, but I don't have any pixels selected. So we're gonna save the microstructure. So when I save a microstructure, it saves the images that are part of it. It does not save um, skeletons or meshes. Give it a file name. Um, then we'll dot mic say, now there are three formats that file data files can have. So there are three file formats that you can use to save data. One is just actually saving Python code. And when you load a file that's saved in script format, it's loading it as a Python script. It's evaluating anything that you put in it. So you can take that file, you can edit it, you can add Python code, you can put loops and function calls, whatever you want. So that means it's very flexible. Um, it can contain any Python code. It means it's dangerous. It can contain any Python code. Someone sends you a data file in script format. You want to make sure that you know what it is before you actually load it. The ASCII format is like the script format, but it's not actually read by the Python parser. So you can't add arbitrary Python code to it because it won't understand it, um, but you can edit it it's human readable. And so that's a useful format if you're sharing with someone and you want to be able to see what's actually in it, the file. So it's less dangerous. The binary format is not easily human readable or easily editable. It has two advantages. One is that it preserves all the bits. It's not writing the numbers out in ASCII. It's actually storing all the bits and it's safe and it's fast. Um, it can be much faster to load the binary file. So I'm going to just save this file. I'll save it in binary. Um, the next thing to do after we've defined material groups is I can assign, let's define pixel groups. I can assign materials to those groups. Um, the materials page here um, has two panes. The material pane on the right just lets you create a new material or one. Chalk, chocolate, um, and the property pane on the left allows you to create properties, um, give properties parameters and add them to the material. So I can click here on color. If I click parameterize or I double click on color, it brings up a dialog box to set the color. Um, I can choose the format of the color that I want. I'll just use RGBA and I wanna make a brown color. I practice making brown. 
there. So I've, now this color is brown and I can add it to the material. I'll make another material. Um, well, okay, the next thing to do, I always forget to do this, is after you've created the material, you have to assign it to the pixels. So click assign to pixels and it lets you assign to the selection or all the pixels or the pixel groups. So I'll assign this to the chocolate group, click OK. Now I can make another color material. I'll call it um, MM for marshmallow um, and create a, add the color to that. Now if I take the same color, this color is the brown color and add it and just change the parameters of it here, it's not going to do what you want. That's going to change the color of the chocolate color that I already created. If to add a different color, I have to create a different property. So I copy the property, give it a name, call it pink. Now I can double click on that um, and, and change the color to pink. OK, add that property to the material and then assign this material to the um, other pixel group. Click OK. Now I can see what I got. I can go to the graphics window and create a new layer. And this I will. This is a way of displaying a microstructure by choosing its material. And the colors that are you can specify here are for those pixels that don't have a material or don't have a or have a material but don't doesn't have a color. Uh, those aren't relevant at the moment, I hope, if I did it right. Click OK. And so this now is a different representation of the material. The image here was a rep was the image of the a modified image of the material. This is the pix the materials that I've assigned to the image. So it's it's a different set of information about the the um, microstructure. The next thing to do is to create a skeleton. The skeleton, remember, is the geometry of the finite element mesh. So the new button here, I can, again, automatic, I could give it a name if I wanted to. I will accept the automatic name. I can say I want six elements in the y direction, four elements across, and let them be quadrilaterals. Click OK. And it's now brought up the um, a picture of the skeleton. These white lines on here are an artifact of the graphics, and I, sometimes they go away. Um, go back to the viewer toolbox and fill again. Sometimes those lines go away if you just change the scale slightly. So. All I've done is drawn the skeleton lines on top of the um, microstructure. We need to modify the skeleton so it tries to match that microstructure. And that means that I need to talk about how we talk about element quality and how it gets adapted to microstructure. So there are two things that OOF tries to do to elements, which is one is make them good shapes, which have good numerical properties. And the other is to make the elements homogeneous. So good shapes generally are equilateral. So squares and equilateral triangles are good. Flat triangles, highly distorted rectangles are bad. So we have a shape quality, call it S. It goes to zero for bad elements, goes to one for good elements. And then there's homogeneity. So an element that is completely homogeneous um, has homogeneity of one. An element that's nearly homogeneous has a homogene homogeneity near one. And an element that's not homogeneous has a homogeneity less than one. And you can see just by the way that this element here matches the boundary between the, the different kinds of pixels in this image that if I had an image that was made out of only homogeneous elements, I didn't have things in it like this, it would be a better representation of the material. And so OOF tries to maximize the quantity you can write like this. There's some weighting parameter alpha, which you can set. 
that tries to maximize this combination of the, the shape and the homogeneity. And in the code itself, you'll sometimes see mentioned in energy, and energy is just the opposite of this. It's trying to minimize the energy, but it's the you know one minus this quantity. I can go back to here, and I could I go to the main OOF page. On the skeleton page, um, there's this refine command. So first, over here on the skeleton page, it shows me some information about the current skeleton, how many nodes and elements it has. And then down at the bottom, there's a homogeneity index. The homogeneity index is computed from the homogeneities that are computed by for each element that I just mentioned. And these are, um, basically this index tells you, if I were to cover, um, if I were to make each element completely the material type of that it's dominated by how much um, of the microstructure is represented properly. So this says 72% would be represented properly. I can show you can see what that means. If I go to the new create a new layer and display skeleton by material color. And now that is each element so these elements are dominated by the, the uh, marshmallows, and these elements are dominated by the um, chocolate. I can flip back in between, forth and between them. And I can go back to the microstructure, to the skeleton window, and apply these tools that modify the skeleton. So the simplest one here is refine. Refine is going to subdivide each element that isn't homogeneous. And you can specify what you mean by not homogeneous by specifying this threshold. You can specify how it's going to do the bisection. Let's just how it's going to do the refinement. Let's do it by bisection. And you can specify what it's going to use for the parameter alpha that determines how much it how much weight it gives to shape and homogeneity when it has to make decisions about what to do. So I can click here and um, refine this the skeleton and the more I click, the closer this image becomes to the um, one I started from. And so that's not a bad representation in terms of, so this is now, I've, what you're seeing is each element highlighted, and I turn the element edges off, each element highlighted, colored by the dominant material that it has. So it's the material that it would be using if it wanted finally goes around to doing the calculation. Trouble with this is that the way I did it is I created some really badly shaped elements. And furthermore, there's another problem with it, which is that I've over-refined the skeleton. So here you see, these are four views of the same microstructure. This is a, the top row is a skeleton that was refined to a reasonable amount. And so even though there's a stair-stepped pixel boundary here, the element edges um, form a smooth line. So this is the same thing, the same skeleton, but now I've colored each element by its dominant pixel color rather than coloring just, rather than showing the pixels. If I refine too much, you can get something like this, where the um, boundary, here, here it is colored again by the, okay, I've got the picture switched. This is colored by the um, elements and this is the pixels. So I refine too much and what happened is that it's now starting to try to follow the boundary, but actual jagged boundary between the pixels. And that's not a physical boundary. That's an artifact of the image. Now, how do you know that? Well, that's again, that depends on what your image is and how you made the image and do you really want to follow those pixel boundaries or not. So that's a judgment call that you have to make. Um, but remember that there's this hierarchy of, of approximations that goes into this calculation. You started with an actual material. You created an image of the material. That's an approximation to the material. You created a segmented image by that from that by assigning material properties to the features in the image. 
then you created a skeleton, which is an approximation of the segmented image, and you're going to compute a solution on the finite element mesh, and that solution is, itself is a numerical approximation to the actual solution. So it doesn't make any sense to make the mesh too fine. So I'm going to delete this skeleton. Um, go back to the main window. And delete the skeleton. Yes, delete it. And show you a tool we have, which is what this auto button does, is it creates a new skeleton using and adapts it to the mesh using a set of rules that we have found often works well. No guarantee that it actually works perfectly in any case. Um, you give it a, a two scales. One is the, lar the largest scale of the features you want to cover. So it's going to determine what the largest elements are. And you can specify what units you're giving that scale in. Since I, I'll just use uh, physical units because I set the height to be one. So I, let's say I, the, the largest thing I want to resolve is sort of like this. So um, I'll set this max scale to 0.2. And the min scale, I'm going to set to 0.03. I don't want the elements to be too small. Now I'll say I don't need them to be 100% homogeneous, so that 90% is fine. So also, I should have mentioned any time you see a widget like this, I can slide it um, or pipe in the box. I'll click OK, and what it does is it's going to go through a bunch of steps. Um, the yellow dots that showed up were where it was pinning, briefly pinning elements on the edges. So it's pinning the nodes to the so that they wouldn't move on the next step. So it, it did some refinement. It then did some smoothing, and it comes up with a um, pretty good result. Now, I don't think I, I think I forgot to mention that when you're going through these tools, so one of the things that I encourage you to do is, is experiment. And so there is a manual that covers most things, um, but there also are tool tips when you um, just hover your mouse over the names of things in here. In most places, it will tell you a little bit about what they're doing that helps you figure out what to do. Um, so here I've created a new skeleton. We can see how good it is. I'll have to, because I deleted the layer that contained the old material color or the old skeleton, I'll create a new one here. It actually is, is pretty good. You, there wasn't much change that you saw when it displayed the new. So what I will do is turn off the skeleton edge display again, and now I can toggle back and forth. This is the skeleton elements colored by their material. And this is the pixels colored by their material. And you toggle back and forth, and you can see where the differences are. And whether you want to go back and clean up those differences, well, again, that's that's up to you. That depends on exactly what problem you're solving and you know what what's important to you. Um, I think I forgot to mention also this layer editor, this list of layers that show up in the um, graphics window here. There's a bunch of faint lines that that you probably can't make out right there. Those are hidden layers that they exist. They're the do they do the things like displaying the pixel selection and stuff. And if you go to settings and list all layers, you can see all of them. And then you can do things like edit the um, color of the, the selected pixels if you want to. I'll leave it turned off because it's distracting. If I go back to the main OOF window now, the homogeneity index for this skeleton is 98%. That means 98% of the pixels are in an element that has the same material as the pixel. So that's a pretty good mesh. Now, if I want to solve a real problem, I actually have to finish putting in the material properties. So remember, we had only added color. Color isn't going to help me solve anything that's just for display. So let's say I want to do an elasticity property with, with thermal expansion. I, so I can go back to the properties pane here. Properties are grouped in general categories. The mechanical property includes elasticity. Elasticity has isotropic and anisotropic varieties. I'll click anisotropic here, 
and double click on qubit to select the anisotropic qubit elasticity. There are different ways you can enter it. This pull down menu here lets me choose between the CIJ components or LeMay or E and new. And if I enter one, so under CIJ here, notice the values are 1.5, 0.25. If I change one of these, it will change the others to be consistent. If I go to E and new and I change the anisotropy to 0.5, I can go back to CIJ and notice that it changed that one to 0.125. So everything is consistent. Click OK. I can add that property to the material. Because it's anisotropic, it's not well defined unless I say what its orientation is. So I can double click on orientation here and add an orientation. Orientation can be specified as a Euler angles in all of these different formats. Uh, ABG is that mutual alpha, beta, gamma. And I can you know, set those to whatever I want. Click OK, add that property to the material. And I can go to the chocolate material and similarly, add an elasticity to it. Let's just make it and iso make it isotropic. And I'll get, again, isotropic like the others, except it doesn't have an anisotropy coefficient. You can specify in various ways. I'll just use the default values and click OK. Now, those materials are already added to the, the pixels. I don't have to do anything more. So I can now go to the FE, the mesh page, create a finite element mesh. And click New. And this lets you choose um, the order of the elements. So the order of the finite element interpolation, I'll make them second order here and click OK. Um, it tells you what element types it used. Now, fields and equations. So, so fields and equations, um, the terminology, that we use, a field is defined. It means if it has, it has values on the mesh, um, it's active. It means that I'm going to solve for those values. In plane means that there are no Z derivatives. So this is a generalization of what of plane strain. Um, equations are active if they're going to be solved. And if I have an active equation, there's I either have to say that I'm solving the associated plane flux equation for it, which is you know, the equivalent of plane stress, or that those the field is in the plane, because I have to do a two-dimensional calculation. I can go to this page, and I wanted to solve, a, I said, a, a thermal conduct, thermal expansion problem. So I'm defining the displacement, I'm gonna go, then I'm going to solve for it, and the temperature, I'm going to solve for that. The heat equation will be active, and let's do the plane flux equation and the force balance equation. Um, now, I can, can set boundary conditions, go to new. The boundary condition dialog box works a little differently than the others because you want, usually want to apply a bunch of them at a time. So instead of just clicking OK after each one, you can click Apply, and then it, it just won't close. I'm going to set the temperature to be zero on the bottom. So the temperature appears in the, as a, in the heat equation. I'm going to select the bottom boundary, the value is 0, and click Apply. And then I'm going to set it to be 0 0.05 on the top boundary and click Apply. So the reason it's 0 0.05 and 0 is related to what I put in for the numbers that I used for the thermal conductivity. With um, which was just one. So temperature of 0 0.05 is, um, is reasonable. I'm not using real temperature units, in other words. And then for the displacement, um, I'm going to change this to displacement. And for obscure reasons, OOF asks you to set the, both the equation and the field at the same time. Um, it doesn't assume that you're using the one one type of equation to solve. What I'm saying is that boundary conditions could conceivably cross from you know, displacement field to the um, force balance equation, for example, because they're coupled. Um, so let's just set the 
the position of the bottom left corner of this. So I'll set X and X displacement to zero on the bottom left corner and the Y displacement also to zero on that corner. That's not enough to actually constrain the whole system because the whole thing could rotate. So I'm going to also set the Y displacement to zero on the bottom right corner. Click OK, because that's the last one. I've set now five boundary conditions. Then I go to the solver page. I have to say how I'm going to solve this problem. So um, there's only, oh, I haven't talked about sub problems. There's only one sub problem, which is the whole thing, the default one. I can click on that to set the solver. There are two modes, basic mode and advanced mode. Um, basic mode picks the solver for you and you set only a few parameters and you can choose that adaptive and uniform or steppers that you would use if you were solving a time dependent problem, which we're not, so we'll just leave it on static. And you can set whether you want to solve the matrix equations that the finite element method generates either iteratively or directly. Iterative is usually almost always better. Now, if you're doing this on the current version of, that's at NanoHub, um, we just discovered a problem in solving this particular problem. You'll want to increase the um, max iterations um, to a few thousand. Um, that's a problem that, that will be fixed in the next version. Um, and then, well, I want to hit solve, but it says it can't solve it. It's unsolvable. I can click details and go back to this um, message window. It says it's subproblem is ill posed. There are no flux contributions to the heat equation of the plane flux, plane heat flux equation. Well, that's because when I went back to the materials, oops, okay, I also didn't add this LS property to the top bit. When I went back to the, when I go back to the materials, I didn't add in the thermal conductivity. So the equation, I hadn't finished setting the equations. So I can go back to the thermal conductivity. The default conductivity was one. Let's just add that. Add it to the chocolate. I can add the same one to the marshmallow. Now, I also noticed I didn't add in the, um, the, the thermal expansion. Thermal expansion is a coupling. It couples a less. So it appears down here, it couples um, the temperature and displacement fields, and you can set it again like the elasticity and isotropic or anisotropic ones. I'm just going to set the default values and add that just to the marshmallow. So now the problem is set up. It now says unsolved here on the solver page instead of unsolvable. And I can click solve. There's an activity window that comes up that mostly shows you what's going on sometimes. Um, it doesn't manage to show everything. If I go back to the message window, here it still says solving. And now it says solved, it's done. I go back to the message window, here it is. It's solved a 25,000 by 25,000 matrix in nine iterations. Um, and the residual, the total error at the end was two times seven minus 15. So that's, that's not bad. The reason it didn't take thousands of iterations is that I using a version that actually has fixed the bug that is on the nano hub, current nano hub version. So you notice that back in the graphics window, now it has displayed the mesh and it's displayed it at its default, at its displaced location, which is why it looks blurry up there. Um, I'll just click fill, make sure we're seeing the whole thing, and I don't know why it's doing this. Okay, it was just slow. I'm going to turn off the skeleton edge display, and I'm going to create a new mesh display layer new. Now, mesh can be displayed during a number of things like the material color in the skeleton, but I can also plot quantities on it. So I'll go to filled contour. This 
allows me to choose what it's going to plot. Can like the um, you, you choose if it were time dependent, you'd set this when, or you could do an animation. This what here says what it's going to display. I'm going to choose to display the strain. I can choose either a component or the inv an invariant set invariant, and then what type of strain I'm going to plot. I'll plot the geometric strain and the magnitude is the invariant. Um, and I'm going to say I want that displayed at the actual position, not the original position. That will include the displacements. And click OK. And this takes a second. And now this is a plot of the strain um, magnitude that was computed. This so the strain, the, the higher strains at the top because the temperature was higher there and the thermal expansion was only given to the the marshmallow inclusions. Um, and the boundaries have become wiggly because I didn't fix the boundaries. And this is generally what you would expect to see. You can get more quantitative analysis by going to the analysis page. Um, you choose what kind of output you want. There are scalar and aggregate things. And the next version with the scalar and aggregate will be merged together. And oof 2 3D doesn't distinguish between them. Say what it is you want to evaluate the field. Say I could look at components or derivatives of it or, or um, invariants of it. What you want to do with the output, you could compute just its range. You can send it directly to a, a destination. You could compute statistical quantities on it. You can compute it over different domains. I could evaluate over the whole mesh or a, at a single point or over a pixel group or an element groups if we had created element groups, which we didn't mention. And then how within that domain, it's going to sample it over a set of grid points. The, the options there will depend on actually what the domain is. And then you can send that output to the message window, which is the default, or you could click here on no, new and create a new file to send the output to. I could save the outputs. Um, if I come up with a definition of them here and I want to save it as a name, you can um, give it a name there. Now, boundary analysis is what you would use if you want to um, try to compute effective properties of a system. And also, I should say in UF3D that boundary analysis was merged in with analysis. Um, it's it's a bit simpler that way. So effective properties are something that we get asked about a lot. And the that's the question is why is there no single button that let, let in OOF that lets you just click and and measure the effective properties? And the answer is that it's not obvious what to do in every situation. And what you mean by effective properties is is up to you. So um, you can get different answers by making different assumptions, and so we can't actually do it. So you, but OOF provides the tools that you can use to make those calculations yourself. So what you have to do is make some assumptions about the the anisotropy. If you assume that your system is is isotropic, you may get a different answer than if you assume that it's cubic. Once you know the anisotropy that you're making assumptions for, then you know how many components your modulus has, that how many components you need to solve for. Um, and then you have to design some experiments that let you solve for those components. And the, it, you will get different answers depending on different boundary conditions. So you have to ask yourself, how is my system extracted from the large system? If I take a, a sample here and pull on each side, well, if it has no Poisson's ratio, maybe that is the same thing as pulling on each side with fixed boundaries. Um, but if it does have a Poisson's ratio, I'll get a different answer than if I've got these boundary conditions rather than those boundary conditions. So you make you have to make these assumptions, you have to write down the equations, and then you can make the measurements in OOF and take the answers from your measurements into the equations that you wrote down when you did step two here, and that gets gives you your answer. But it depends. The answer is it depends, and you so you have to decide what it is that you mean. Um, that covers 
what we I wanted to cover in Oof 2, um, things that we didn't cover, there are active areas that let you restrict operations to a single part of the microstructure. There are a lot of skeleton modifiers. Um, skeleton selection page I skipped entirely lets you create groups of elements, edges, and nodes, perform operations on them. They can be useful for uh, changing the way the skeleton modifiers work. OOF2 can read orientation maps from like EBSD data and use orientations from that in doing its calculation. Time-dependent problems um, weren't mentioned um, using different sub-problems. Encourage everyone to explore and experiment. There is a manual. This here is a link to the manual. Um, the manual is out of date, but we hope that, that, the, that the differences between the program and the manual are, actually, are fairly obvious. Um, if more information, you can go to our website. This is a link to the website. Um, there are download and installation instructions if you want to install it on your own workstation. Same for Roof 3D, and um, there's a mailing list that you can join. It's very low traffic. We just people occasion very occasionally post questions, but mostly it's just used to announce new versions. And you can write to us at this email address if you have any questions about the software. So thank you. All right, that was a great presentation. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Andrew, both for sharing your time with all of us today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Oh, we did get a question that just came in. Is there a tool that exists or that you recommend to build a simulated microstructure to calculate in OOF2? I have, I mean, to create an image to load in to, as a starting point, I've done that with any number of graphics programs, it depends. I mean, it depends on, again, you know, what it is that you're trying to do. Um, you know, the, we did a calculation once years ago where I, you know, you be, I used, you know, the equivalent of PowerPoint to create a picture because someone just needed a geometry, a simple geometry. If I don't have, if you weren't trying to, you know, create a 3D microstructure with a particular distribution of sizes of grains, um, I don't know a particular, I know that's, you know, a hot topic of research, but I don't have a recommendation for a particular way of doing that. Um, just as a follow-up, they said a layered structure, for example. One problem with 3D images, which I should point out, um, I don't know whether this is addressing the problem. Um, let me I have a OOF 3D window here. That might be useful. Um, so this is an OOF 3D graphics window, and this is a, a sample of bone. And what you notice is that it's opaque. So every pixel is actually showing the material at its um, at its location in 3D. If you had a picture that looked um, I can fake it by modifying this. If you had, well, if you had a picture, let's say that that only showed the black stuff here, so you could see through um, to the gray part, that would not work in OOF because it needs to have the data at each point. So, looking at a, if you took a a, a mesh like a, a woven sample and just took a photograph of it, um, you'd be seeing more than one Z value in the photograph. The photograph has to have only, apply to only one Z value. And so um, when you're looking through one layer and seeing another one, that just confuses it. You really need a 3D representation of the material like this, rather than a photograph of a 3D material. I don't know if that was useful when I answered any of the questions. Yeah, I think that was great. Um, we had a few more questions come in. Someone asked, how convenient is it to set up the boundary condition for simulations? So, well, that again, depends on exactly what you're doing. If all you're doing is setting the values of forces or fields on boundaries, it, it's quite easy. You use the boundary 
um, condition page, and it predefines boundaries for all the edges. And with 3D, it predefines boundaries at all the edges, faces, and corners, and move to it just the uh, edges and corners. You can also, if you want to apply boundary conditions on other um, boundaries, let's say internal boundaries, you have to define a set of segments. You can, and on the skeleton, you can click on segments and pick them out, or it can automatically choose segments that are boundaries between one material type and another, and then you can apply boundary conditions to those. But the boundary conditions are quite general. It applies Dirichlet boundary conditions, which set um, the values of the field on the boundary. Um, Neumann boundary conditions set the normal components of a flux on a boundary. We also have what we call floating boundary conditions, which set the values of a field, but up to an undetermined constant. So you could say, I want this boundary of the system to have this particular shape, um, but I want it to be able to move up and down. So it, it does, the boundary conditions ought to be easy to, to set. So I see the, the question about the, the bone thing I showed. Um, yes, that was all, that was a pre-processed. It, it, would the same method work if the color of the two phases are similar? Well, you have to have some, something to distinguish the, the, the one phase from the other. And so if OOF itself doesn't do the, the separation for you, you can process the images in something else and then load them into OOF. Oh, one more just came in. Um, do you also provide some kinds of database for different materials? That's something that we have thought would be a great idea. And no, um, we don't have that. There, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of work in the, you know, the materials genome initiative thing for creating databases of material properties. And it would be great if we had a tie into that, but um, we, we don't yet. All right. And then someone in our chat also mentioned a good software for image analysis. If OOF is not great for your image is image J. Yes. OOF is not meant to be an image analysis program. Um, that's why it's, easy to import more than one version of an image into OOF. You can do your image analysis in some other program and import the, the already segmented image. Um, and so the questions about field initialization. So when you initialize a field, you can probably show it on this OOF. I'm not gonna actually do it. I'll just show on the OOF 3D example here. So when I click on field initialization, I can double click or click set. It's the same thing. You can set a field to a constant value. You can copy it from another mesh, or you can choose X, Y, T function. I can initialize, I can type in here any py valid Python expression, um, X squared plus Y, and initialize the field to that, and this is setting the X and Y components of the displacement field. Um, if you're doing a time-dependent problem, you could put a time-dependent field in there too. Um, I click OK here, go back to this page. I should now be recomputing the, um, oh, I didn't click Apply. I click Apply now. Now it switches to Unsolved and Okay, because I clicked in <laughs> completely unreasonable values, it skewed the whole mesh across like that. There was a question I think about, did you answer, Andrew, the question about slices? And um, we would like, the trouble with doing 3D on NanoHub at the moment is it's sort of difficult to get the whole set of slices um, into a NanoHub directory. And I briefly talked with someone about making that easier. We could also add and allow OOF to, instead of loading from a directory, we could make that you know, read all the files from a, a archive a tar file or something like that. Yeah, I don't, I, I answered a few questions about that. Um, somebody, there was a question about whether, um, whether you have to just, whether you have to do serial sectioning to 
get the 3D data? And the answer is no, you don't. Uh, that that is a way to do it. But if you could do you can do tomography and not destroy your sample, but then you need to convert the tomography data to a set of slices for, for OOF to ingest, which is maybe a little bit clunky, but it will work. Right. There's a late-breaking question about predicting material properties again. That that was covered a little bit at the end of the presentation. It's it's complicated because the effective properties make assumptions about, you know, the sort of degree of anis anisotropy. Uh, and what you know, what do you, you need to think about, like, what is it you actually want? Well, like, what do you, what's the effective modulus look like, and what does the equation look like? And then you can do virtual experiments that, you know, enough virtual experiments to cover all of the unknowns to fill in the parameters. Um, that's a very high level, um, so I'm not sure uh, if I've shed the light that was requested. But uh, if if that's not a sufficient answer, uh, Shivan, please do follow up through the OOF Manager mailing list. Great. Thanks again, Andrew and Steve. Thanks for your time today, and thanks for staying a little bit extra. All right. Thank you.